Hi guys, Frankie V from Frozen Sand uh, with a long overdue episode of working with power tools. And in today's episode, uh, I'm going to be covering uh, my side of the turf uh, as to uh, developing uh, animations for uh, urban terror resurgence. And, um, and in this case, as context, uh, uh, how to go about uh, making melee type animations based on uh, uh, what we can do as far as uh, authoring the required assets within my weapon of choice motion builder. Now, if you, I would rec highly recommend if you are a serious, uh, serious uh, into, uh, person as far as animation goes, uh, motion builder is the ultimate choice as far as anything that needs to be covered, be it for a video game or for uh, film production. And uh, well, I would say that uh, <laughs> Excluding the idea that uh, motion capture would actually uh, replace the need for animators, when in reality, the uh, the ability to uh, capture motion has created probably more jobs uh, for animators than uh, than anything else within the history of animation as a whole, for, uh, particularly for the purpose of, like, say, for example, video games production. What has decreased the number of uh, required animators is power applications that have been uh, developed over the, over the past year. I, well, even longer than that, because I can remember uh, uh, I remember uh, a GDC. Not too sure which year that was, but the um, but the uh, keynote. Uh, let's say the information that's being uh, pertained at the time, as far as panel work. Uh, and demonstration goes with the need for more and better productivity tools for the purpose of uh, content creation. And of course, uh, uh, the need for better means of managing a large amounts of data as far as animation goes uh, was also was presented as a, a case in point. So uh, over, over time, of course, the tools becomes better and better and easier and simpler and makes the life uh, and decreases the number of required uh, physical animators to actually take the data that is necessary to produce the final result and decrease the number of people that we actually need. So a uh, motion builder mm, uh, as, as a productivity tool, I would, as an opinion, I would venture replaces the need for at least 10 uh, 10 uh, animators that not only would have to be uh, part of the project as through the necessity of uh, brute force or sweat equity that, uh, that is required to create all the necessary assets for a particular video game. So um, everything that I do within Motion Builder or stuff that can't re that can, well could be done as a, a feature addition to uh, Unreal 4 without without uh, without all the, um, uh, let's say, pain in the butt uh, uh, requirements getting in the way. So, for example, <coughs> retargeting of that uh, animation data is something that you can do over a coffee and donut, where in uh, Unreal 4, ha half the time when you try to uh, convert animations from one uh, structure to another, uh, becomes a, a rather drawn out process that you have to sort of cross your fingers and, and your eyes at the same time and hope that that works out. Uh, Motion Builder just does this as part of its key functionality, and I, uh, I will obviously want to, uh, will be demonstrating that flexibility as we move forward. But to get uh, to get the show on the road here, uh, for what for uh, urban terror resurgence, one of the ideas that we're kind of playing around with is the idea of takedowns, where you know uh, the player in this case uh, uh, as part of a, a, a melee design. You have uh, two characters that have uh, two specific requirements as far as uh, animation goes, but the animation has to kind of sync up as to the event. So this is, uh, in our world, it's referred to as AB sync animation, as the data that is being applied is uh, limited and uh, is dr driven into whatever character is selected where those mo types of modifications need to be done and performed. So usually the starting point is, uh, as far as motion capture information, is to kind of match up the sequences that are occurring so in this case a lot of times i'll use the uh, story mode which allows me to move and slide the animations and scale it up and down until uh, until the, the clean data starts to match up as to the sequence of events that are occurring and then once that's uh, the actual the actual event as the timing is blocked in i can then plot that information to character A and I can plot the other information to character B. So that's what we kind of have as far as setup goes. So as, say for example, 
Uh, just to kind of point it out, uh, not without hopefully bumping around too much. Um, this is our this is a, the framework that we've decided to go with. This is Genesis three females for as uh, generalization of uh, animation goes, and the structures are almost identical except for the root naming of the character. So in this case, uh, Genesis three female we have Genesis three female, which is the actual the actual uh, framework that we need to export the data to uh, to match up with the data, uh, animation requirements in Unreal four as to our character design design pathway. But uh, the data can also be applied to another another character. In this case, an identical uh, copy of the of our framework as being Genesis three female. So the d data uh, inf data information, the animation that is applied to it, knows where to go based on the selection. So let's get back to our, our perspective here. And uh, at the moment, this is how I this is how I select the, diff the two different characters as to the need to be able to edit the animation so that the, both of the sequences uh, I can make line up based on the need ultimately by the time we get it into Unreal 4. So in this case, here's uh, here's model one. We'll hit the transform and we'll hit the hips and anything that involves this character can now be keyframed and moved around, etc, etc. And if we want to be able to uh, make uh, some changes and and what have you and uh, take control of the second or character B uh, It's simply this easy to select uh, between the two of them Easy peasy so uh, what uh, another notation here that needs to be made is uh, Is the location of the characters are defined by the the root of world origin of the two characters in relative position between the two characters So if we apply animation and we plot it down It's applied based on in this case the world origin of zero 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 on the other hand anywhere in location within 3d space it's a sim simply a matter of snapping the root node of say this character will call us uh, sync a to this character and call it sync B. So here's our route for sync for for sync B is located at this position here, relative to the local position of this character within a three-dimensional space. So uh, root of the root of A is relative distance between the the uh, the, the sync and syncing up with the, with with B. That's A, that's B. Okay, syncing up with B by just simply snapping to its local transform node relative to that position. So, uh, as a quick time event, we're la di da di da di and we're sneaking up behind the character. And of course, uh, our character B is uh, idling or, or what have you, or looking around, or worse yet, <laughs> chatting. <laughs> and uh, character, so they deserve to get whatever they get, where character B is coming up in from behind. Let's re-snap back, and we want an event to occur where where the player pushes a button and immediately goes into some form of takedown event. So this is how uh, typically it would, if nothing intercedes as far as completing the cycle from uh, frame zero to wherever it finishes up here. I think it's about 150. This is this is actually an end buffer. Um, you know, I, I just don't want it to snap to any kind of ending. I just, you know, typically you want a, a kind of an ease in and ease out to the as it's playing. As well, say in film, when the, when the when the director goes action, the the, uh, the characters they hold for two three seconds until I actually perform the action, and then when the director says says when the when the scene is finished, the the play, the actors are allowed to play off at the ending of the sequence before the, before the director says cut that way you have an in point and an out, out point and the same should be it is uh, it's common practice to do as far as animation goes so you have a blend in point the ability to add a blend in point and a blend out point to create smooth a smooth transition so if we go ahead and we hit the play button and say okay oh i'm sneaking up behind this guy here is just, you know, typing on his keyboard and, you know, he's uh, not, not being active, not running as he should be. He deserves to be taken down. You hit the, uh, you hit the QT button for the takedown and off it goes. And this is the result of what would occur within this sequence of event, if not interceded between point A and point B. So, okay, so we'll play that through again. Boom, down goes the player. So, 
In essence, in theory, as, as an event, the event has already, for, for all intents and purposes, has occurred at the moment you push the button. It's just the, the event, the sequence being played out. Now, you see this occurring a lot in uh, masher or fighting games where melee is actually occurring. And uh, at times, it, you know, the, the different numbers of combinations and what have you, the action that's taking place, kind of tricks you into thinking that you actually do have some level of control over the, over the actions that are occurring. So, um, me personally, there's been more than one occasion where I'm sitting there and I'm flipping the buttons and moving the joystick handle, even, even though that the event has already been predefined and it's going to play out, even if I left the, left the joystick alone and didn't touch any buttons. Unless, of course, some other event inter intercedes. So this is where, where, where compounding your melees, you know, is uh, is best is best performed as to how it's how the sequences are played out are first done as part of the authoring of the melee uh, m the uh, melee um, sequences. So sure, you can buy melee packages that are ready for Unreal Four and plug them in. And sit there and try to figure out how to connect all these different melees within the combinations based on on a particular event so in this case we have we'll call this takedown a we can have a takedown b takedown c a punch in the face a a punch in the b f, f, face b or c or d or whatever that's uh that's uh you know you could probably figure out how to uh, stage that in unreal 4 but it's difficult to figure that out out as to authoring the animations because once you start seeing it from that perspective you can start to anticipate the, the where things need to change based on on um, the, the dynamics of, of of a given event that could occur within the course of that event as, a, as I mentioned before once you press the button the outcome is already determined unless that determ whatever event that, uh, that ultimately ends in in the player being on the ground is uh, intervened with uh, with uh, a dy another dynamic of the game. So if, say, for example, uh, you know, we hit the button and nothing intercedes, boom, down goes the player, no saving the player at, at a given point. So in this case, the point in which to, you know, all hope is lost, as far as our poor little player B goes, would be starting at about, looks like... Uh, frame 42 so between frame frame 0 and frame 42 is the opportunity for our poor little player B to save herself from ultimate destruction of uh, being knifed in the stomach as a final result so during the course of this, uh, our player sneaking up what can it, we have to take into consideration what are the events that could occur that deviates from what the normal outcome would be so in this case uh, SA somebody had clear across the map with an SR8 sees that this is actually occurring takes a head a perfect headshot uh, it, the, the, at that stage then the uh, the quick time event the QT event would have to break off into a different uh, and different uh, direction as far as, as far as the animation a migration pathway goes and our player A is the one who actually lands up dead on the ground which is uh, a, a, a simply an override of any type of animation within the, the stock realm of the game so we we get this far player gets shot we kick over to the player is dead, and of course the uh, the player B is simply allowed to, to sort of stand there, I guess, and think that uh, that they're lucky that they that they got somebody across the map saved their life <laughs> as to the ultimate outcome. If we get to this point, at this stage here, we still have a window of opportunity for the player to save themselves. So we're, we're talking like maybe 38 or 39 or even 37. Uh, player B realizes that uh, that she's in trouble, and the player who's controlling this character obviously takes uh, uh, counterattack measures. In this case, let's say for example, uh, uses the uh, uses the rifle that she has in her hand as a means to block the incoming blow. So it, it, at this stage here, you hit the corresponding counter move button, and of course you block it up to this point here, and then. The whole the whole animation migration pathway would deviate and go into a different uh, uh, different uh, direction based on player B blocking the uh, the attack and surviving it. So this so at this stage here, 
the rest of what whatever would be required to play out is discarded for some other for some other melee form of melee counterattack, so to speak. So you start building this up and building this up. Uh, in the case of motion builder, of course, as as we're as we're developing our, our primary uh, cause and effect loop, in this case, once again we hit the play button. Ultimately, if nothing occurs. This is how things played out. Now, during this course, we can then make uh, uh, animation uh, authoring decisions. Let's say of uh, how uh, sync A would uh, has to has to play out versus sync B based on conditional uh, changes within that uh, within that particular event. So if uh, once again, you know, anywhere across down the, the pathway here, the, uh, it, the you know somebody with an SRA takes a headshot, player goes down as normal, and the rest of whatever that would normally have to play out as far as the uh, AB sync goes is discarded. On the other hand, if the player B sees that, oh, I'm about to be uh, being being shanked here. Uh, they can then perform a counter, which then, if to make that counter move, we can simply create a new take, copy the data to it, and then truncate this this data on both A and B tracks down to uh, starting at track zero, or use a funky uh, tracking system in uh, motion uh, tracking system in uh, Unreal Four to actually, you know intercede at uh, create an, a point that where player B can intercede between say frame 30 say between 35 and let's say uh, 41 a very narrow shallow uh, window of opportunity to actually counter so this is where your button mashing comes in because uh, although the event has been determined, there's usually a window of opportunity for you to counter that move, which usually involves start mashing keys. As you know, obviously there's there's no indicator uh, usually to say you better push this button now or you're toast. Some games actually do that. Uh, predominantly, I've seen that being used in say, for example, um, uh, uh, Far Cry, Far Cry 4, 3, as well as. Um, as uh, 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 t t t Tomb Raider, where you know you get the you know better mash button A now, and you start mashing it, do B, do Y, do Z, and then that's the, finally the, that allows you to to intercede on on the sequence, the melee sequence of an animal trying to tear your throat apart, based on uh, sequences that are occurring within a given window frame of window. But if you were just simply to let the whole sequence play out, you're basically toast. So that's uh, basically the, the basics. This is basically demonstrating here what would be considered the uh, walk cycle of uh, A, B, sync uh, animation for the purpose of melee attacks. Now, uh, once again, to be considered, of course, is uh, A might be B, where and B is, is now substituted in the position of, of A. So this is why it's called A B sync because the, uh, the the animation as it is authored can match with either character A or with character B or with any other character that you wish to include as part of the pipeline. So in this case, um, let's say as far as uh, uh, making animations uh, syncs up with, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, a different character, totally different framework. Uh, based uh, 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 on uh, compliance of the rigging system itself being com compatible with the current design pathway. Um, let's do something a little bit silly here. Okay, baby's always fun. <laughs> so we select the baby, uh, our, our little baby um, model here. Wait for it to come in. Which is uh, uses the same uh, Genesis 3 framework as uh, our Genesis 3 framework that we're using now. And if we want, we can select our baby, which is now brought in as D5, and assign a, a, an input as from one of the different, uh, uh, from either the A or the B. So if we select uh, uh, character 5, which is our baby, and assign it to the, 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 the animation data from uh, source from G4, which is, uh, which is G4, which is this gal our character B as part of our sync and we hit play yeah <laughs> even though the size there is an obvious size difference between the two character to the the uh, animation automatically adjusts for it adjusts for for you 
as to the relative size difference between uh, a, uh, our character B as being A and uh, our poor little baby here who just got knifed and, and uh, takes the big fall. So easy peasy targeting. But now, okay, let's say, for example, we want to be able to uh, have a lot of different characters with using different uh, different uh, rigging uh, setups as far as authoring the animation goes as to comp being compatible with the a with the AB sequences that we have actually authored that is exported to Unreal 4. Uh, let's, let's use an example here. We're using, the, 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 as I mentioned, the Genesis 3 framework, which means all of our skeletal rigs is set up to, to allow for face th things like expressions and facial animations or what have you. But uh, say, for example, okay, well, you know, we need to be able to include uh, include Epic's uh, uh, standard uh, uh, rigging system into it as far as the mannequin goes. And of course, when you're usually doing, trying to do the three targeting in Unreal 4, uh, you always have a different a difference in between the original source and the animation that is authored unless it's made specifically for that character so if we want our animations to match up um, with the unreal 4 mannequin uh, you know we have a very narrow window of flexibility if we're using any other application um, i know in 3ds max it would be a pain in the butt to retarget data uh, as input from uh, one character to another where motion builders uh, eats this kind of stuff for breakfast so to bring in a character mannequin based on the uh, based on the uh, uh, epics uh, default uh, uh, animation framework we're going to bring in another another character into the scene and there it stands with absolute, absolutely no input but let's uh, change the input from this character to say uh, uh, which character would that be? Genesis G3? Yeah, okay. Say we want to replace the, anima the animation to be uh, retargeted to, uh, well, let's say a slightly oversized uh, epic uh, 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 character model as defined as being the standard, so to speak. We can certainly retarget e quite simple and easily that it is required for that mannequin. Oh, actually, we can kind of mess things up here a bit. Okay, so we'll select the mannequin, and we're going to take our input from G3 to direct drive the uh, Epic uh, uh, framework. So if we go ahead and play now, boom. Okay, <clears throat> relative to the different sizes of the, the characters, uh, Motion Builder automatically adjusts for and compensates for the size difference. We can not, we can use a compensator to actually bring the uh, animation and the characters a little bit more tighter in line to what we need to be able to produce the same kind of results as compared to the relative size of the person that we're going to attack. So quite easy to be able to replace uh, uh, and uh, retarget animation this way than it would be uh, any other means. How about Robo Mannequin? Let's see where we can do with that. Okay, no animation. We're going to merge it in as a different character set. Boom, and it comes. This is actually the older version of the of the mannequin. So we got Robot Man, and we're going to take and drive him with three and snaps into place relative to that position. Hit the play button. Performs the same identical identical A B sequences necessary for this particular character uh, that we then would export this unique to the, to the epic. Uh, the epic character in Unreal 4. So very flexible as to being able to author the necessary animations without having to resort to trickery in, in Unreal 4 as to conforming the data to whatever it is that we need to do. We create and, and edit everything at the source level. So everything's fixed this way. Now to kind of demonstrate that further about, uh, about sync animation and what have you, which basically means that uh, at the uh, animation verbose Okay, well, I should demonstrate um, uh, somewhat of how we can export this. Okay, the uh, epic stuff is brought in as a unique character, so it can be uh, exported, like, for example, uh, based on on its uh, unique identifiers as to structure. Uh, in other words, uh, the root up to, from toes to nose, is uh, compatible with the current rig in Unreal 4. So if I select a mannequin with the source of the G3, I can plot that da data down to the skeleton 
which turns the source from this character to none. But we have that as a character selection, we have that selected in our character control panel. So anything that is data oriented as to this character is exportable uh, as a unique uh, element of that character based on whatever take that we're using down here. Okay, starting to get into the confusing zone, right? <laughs> Because uh, basically, there's a lot of different uh, flexibility as to what you, where you can send data, data where the data comes from. Uh, it can be inputted from a motion capture device. Uh, one day, um, you know, I'm thinking of getting a little bit more into finer detail as the facial animation, uh, particularly how a tool like Motion Builder, um, although expensive, can offset a lot of uh, a lot of your financial costs as far as the need for dialogue uh, goes by simply using some of the features that are already built into it and doesn't require you to go out and buy thousands of dollars worth of motion capture uh, devices that uh, most of the other solutions require you to purchase in the first place. So amortized, if you're looking at it from an amortized cost point standpoint, you've got to kind of look at the, everything it's going to cost you to be able to produce the kind of output you want and amortize those costs between the different uh, possible solutions. So the ability to be able to generate uh, uh, lip sync uh, dialogue is automatically built in as a device that takes audio and converts that to motion without the need of hiring uh, actors, without the need to purchase uh, rather expensive motion capture uh, uh, devices, uh, be it uh, for performance capture or just to make, uh, uh, make your uh, character do a song and dance kind of thing. So uh, uh, back on course here, we got our data plotted down to, to our root uh, bones that it's been uh, driven by a characterization system. It's kind of like an exoskeleton type of uh, feature where, where every character that you bring in uses the same hierarchical type of uh, uh, structure as an exoskeleton uh, and, and drives whatever uh, b bone system that's underneath it. And then when you're done and ready to export, you would plot that data down to the to the to directly to the bone level, regardless of whatever uh, type of uh, uh, configuration or, or rigging system that you're using for any particular character, and then just uh, adjust the output to exactly what you need for whatever character that you're developing. And um, a side benefit too, as well, is um, is there's a one-to-one -one correl correlation between how things are exported from Unreal 4 and brought into uh, Motion Builder as FBX is a native format to Motion Builder to begin with. This is where FBX started. This is this is home. This is grandpa, so to speak. So anything that is FBX ex exported along that pipeline has to be or should be compatible with Motion Builder. And if it's not, it, you know, if something comes out of uh, FX uh, Unreal 4 that is not compatible with uh, with the requirements of mo putting bringing in a motion builder, then the screw ups on Epic's part and not uh, the problem of motion builder to begin with. So, anyways, moving on, moving forward. Uh, th at this th at this stage, we have the option to just go ahead. Let's save out our save out our uh, our FBX. Now we can do this in batch form. We can save one take per per file or and use take name. Now, for most cases, this is how you're going to configure it because you need individual individual clips that uh, pertain to whatever action it is that you animate. So you might want to, so in one case, you would want an A track for sync. You want an A track and you want a B track built on the same framework, which means that you can use that A or B as on either character at any time. So you would go ahead, say this export. So we get the, uh, we got to kind of type in a name here. We hit the save button and we're presented with this panel as to, to the clips that we want to export. Uh, in this case, uh, we're, we're, we'll be importing the, the animation data directly into Unreal 4, so we can don't need the control rig, and we don't need the character extensions. Exter character extensions are very, very powerful uh, in regards to unique characterizations of, let's say you needed to do a spider. You know, the, the same features that you apply to a biped character, by default, Motion Builder knows the difference. It's it's object aware. In other words, if you say, okay, this is a, a quad or a biped character, then all the tools and outputs and inputs are adjusted to, to natural behaviors that would be considered um, usable by for a biped character. So 
you know, typical uh, editing processes part of the animator's duty is to go in and start playing around with curves and ease in and ease out. Um, that that kind of workflow is no longer required as far as as creating something that is usable because uh, a motion builder automatically adjusts auto adjusts its keyframing to the ease in and ease out that is not necess that is necessary for uh, a biped or quad. Uh, based animation. So moving on, uh, we can then have, as an option output all these takes here that we have. We have all these animations. This could be, as you can see, is four different levels of takes. We can ex we can export as much as we want as long as it's within our our selection here. So it's not uncommon for for example to work on a, a base your base animations within a single. Um, uh, a single uh, FBFX package, so this could be, you know, it's it's four, four takes or four separate right now, four separate animation sequences. But this could be I don't know, 100, 200 sequences, depending on how much memory you have and so forth, to be able to uh, uh, to to manage that amount of data. That no, this is why this the particular application is so popular, is everything is with edited within the same world, so you can quite easily start matching up different types of animation or recycling you know you you need a run forward and you need a run back you can base your run back on your run forward by flipping your keys around which in I can guarantee you if you try to reverse your keys in in uh, 3ds max what will happen in, in most cases is you'll get uh, some kind of uh, timing error it says no you can't do that you're, you're screwing up the timing so usually if you want to you want the mirror or the reverse you usually just start taking the keys that's over here and moving it in front and you keep doing that and doing that and doing that until your character now that was running forward at one time is now running backwards so it saves you a lot of time of being able to recycle work that's already been been done uh eight way sequences are actually quite simple too as well because you can base everything off of just a simple run forward you know you can run left run right left, run 45 left 45 right uh, and the same thing as well as you can take that data and then just flip it around and reverse it and you have the opposite direction already done up for you and cooked within the same package so you would have like nine sequences here based on a, the need for a match set now match setting I'll just kind of cover that um, quickly hopefully uh, match set creating a match set is pretty rather important as far as is what would be considered ready as far as eight-way movement goes eight-way movement meaning the directions that you can move the joystick in and there should be always be you can do do the direction change procedurally but then it always turns out to be um very uh, very you know very how should i put it um it's it's like the player is is, is robotic uh, it's kind of floating it's kind of sleepy and lazy where with the uh, with the, with the necessary targets in place uh, the blending into it can be controlled based on of course scaling up or down the keyframes for that particular uh sequence so if you need to put player to move left and right with all the sequences say done as 20 procedurally you can change the speed between moving left and right to say say 10 or scale it up to 45 or whatever it is you need to base it off of just a, a match set of animations so that becomes a lot easier you're not coming back into motion builder and correcting the timing just because the you know the, the 45 degree run it looks a little bit sloppy as compared to the speed that you would normally expect for that character run and you see that a lot actually um that's the, another one of my pet peeve is it's this linear movement between left and right changes and when they do change their direction they're not their pivot is not centered where it should be uh, the pivot is located on the hips where the character should be turning from as far as being centered to the character where a lot of times they just they 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 turn the capsule which causes this rather wide sweeping kind of effect when they're changing directions be it left or right forward or or moving off in 45 degree angles okay so anyways that's my kind of rant for the moment now there so but we'll kind of finish things up as to something that would be considered rather cool as to let's say um, scripting for 
uh, scripting for the purpose of uh, uh, of cutscenes. You know, this is where this is where the animator has the opportunity to do some serious, getting their characters to do serious acting, whether they're using um, using uh, 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 what you call it, um, uh, creative uh, uh, motion capture, uh, uh, you know, performance capture. That's it. Sorry about it. Where you have that rig for the face and you know and the action of the body action which is which means that ultimately the uh, end result will be picture perfect a uh, one-to-one match be, uh, as to the ca- acting capability of the performance versus the output that uh, generally uh, <laughs> comes out on the other end in Unreal 4. Um, I'm not going to go off on a rant here <laughs> it's too much of a diversion but there's always there's always this mm, let's say this by night uh, this finite problem as to overall fidelity between how things are authored in in an application like motion builder as to okay this is how i see it this is how i expect it to be translated once it moves over into unreal 4 and once into unreal 4 it's just a matter of doing a setup and somebody pushes a button and exactly how i see all this action performed in this application is what's translated over into the engine as to being rendered out in real time as to expectations doesn't work out all the time you're always getting in having to get in there as far as unreal 4 goes and start changing numbers and uh, buffering and whatever until until the animator sees the perfect perfection and that's the power of the animator is their ability to look at something and say you know and and make that decision to say well you know this is wrong this doesn't look right or and here's why or to look at it and say, hey, this is working. This is the way it's supposed to be, and of course, the reasons why. And this is where this is where my rant for for uh, which my call comes in, um, based on the facial an- uh, the destruction and the ugliness of the facial animation. Was you know somebody looked at it and that and said to themselves, hey, this looks okay. <laughs> Where I'll guarantee you, a skilled animator of any level would have looked at that. My mom would have looked at that and said, no way. So anyways, moving on. Uh, that's my little, hopefully, rant for now. Uh, let's, uh, let's do a new. And take a look at, um, take a look at, at uh, some tools that we could use to build up a really nice cutscene for you know for our animations based on <coughs> using the, uh, the fight sequence uh, uh, sample animation as uh, as our core root of uh, interaction now the, most of this can apply towards uh, any like for example if you need to do dialogue you need characters that need to interact it's, it's basically the same process uh, as it would be for doing an ab sync simply by making sure that everything snaps to a, a, a local transform relative to whatever the initial character is so if we have an a character their root becomes the predominant location within our scene of where everything else needs to snap to to make sure that everything syncs and matches up now that's uh, actually cr- kind of easy to do uh, and of course uh, we would have to divert into a discussion of the differences between in place versus uh, root motion but everything in the world of uh, of uh, of animated feature films or whatever use that you have is generally based on root motion to begin with being the root is of course is that single point in as to origin space or if it's if you decide to use the hips as world space origin so mm, that's that's one of the things that uh, most people have kind of hyped up about the problems with the um, with the uh, uh, that uh, that package I can't really recall what it is. The Mixamo, the Mixamo package doesn't have what would be considered a atypical root node, and it simply just uses the hip, which makes it difficult to maintain relative position of the character, unless, of course, you can consider that the character itself can be considered as being root origin, so to speak. But it's not really set up to be able to um, make um, any kind of video game editing um, as for the purpose of doing uh, uh, cutscenes or even syncing uh, easy, let's say, where if you have a single root node, you can move it anywhere you want and position the character in 3D space relative to each of your character within within our current setup. So to to hyper hyper extend that theory, uh, let's take a look at uh, what I got here. Let's see if I have, I 
think I have that already set up. I should have it set up. Let's see. Let's do a refresh. There we go. Okay. Just need to be refreshed. Okay. Uh, one of the things I like to do is just uh, rip the uh, cool animations out of uh, uh, Unreal 4. Once again, psh, just an easy, easy peasy uh, process. There is a slight, uh, a slight uh, requirement. You know, renaming tape, takes and stuff like that. I might uh, go so far as to raise that as a complaint maybe one day as, as something that needs to be updated. But uh, uh, FBX is a native source to, as I said, Motion Builder. So anything that you can export out of, of uh, Unreal 4 as to net the FBX format could or should be considered as being a source file. So be it that you want to import it into Blender or if you want to include in 3ds Max or Maya. 3ds Max and Maya, of course, being part of uh, a part of the Autodesk uh, lineup, so, similar to Motion Builder, uh, it, uh, FBX is generally cross-platform compatible within this family. So, uh, you know, that, that's why it's such, you know, these are such... Uh, <laughs> powerful application and of course worth every penny that you pay for it uh, you know it once again it's pay, paying for convenience rather than it is pay, not paying for something that's uh, that you can get for free so anyways back to the, our little story here we'll go ahead and just uh, uh, bring in our trooper main animation and we'll just uh, we'll just uh, turn on like we can fl quickly uh, sorry about the bumping on the microphone I'm a little bit close to my keys as to functionality so if we go control uh, or control a yeah okay control a selects the vis visibility of the x-ray mode here between selecting uh, uh, a mesh we don't have mesh uh, we but we do have our, our skeletal based animation here so we'll just make that visible and of course we don't require for raw data we do not require that we actually have mesh in the first place remember of course that uh, that the data just reconfigure itself as to the relationships between whatever whatever we target this animation towards so this would be our main character uh, that you would see and, and you'll start recognizing this of course as we play through it so if we go ahead and hit play there's our poor guy you know, boom, boom, boom. And if we play it through, we're considering, taking into consideration that the entire thing plays out over 100, uh, 1,990, or let's say 2,000 frames, just to make the math easy. So <clears throat> so this is uh, what's what would be considered verbose um, editing, meaning there's more data here than what would actually need to be in in uh, uh, transferred over to Unreal 4 to make it usable, as opposed to making, say, say individual cuts based on the action. But for a cutscene, this is something that you really couldn't do with most most engines, as as usually there was some sort of hard coded limitation as to how much data you could feed in as part of of the uh, the authoring process. So 2,000 frames, we can go 10 minutes, we can go 20 minutes uh, as as far as the data goes, and uh, and Unreal 4 would be more than happy to parse that data and at least play it back to to some degree of acceptability. So, you know. Uh, the fact that we, we're, we're generating one main character based over based over a time frame of 2,000 frames is pretty in itself pretty impressive. So uh, we kind of match that up to what we're actually seeing in the sample as actually uh, occurring that we when you play play that uh, um, that particular sample back as to what's actually happening. But uh, breaking things down, of course, uh, in, in the case as to usability. Um, we have, uh, we would generally have one, two, three, four, five, a total of five, what would be, uh, usually be five unique characters. That in itself can get rather uh, expensive if we want to do the entire sequence uh, uh, verbose, meaning, of course, everything in one go kind of idea as to being excessive. But in this case, each of the characters can act out the role within the, in the stream of things. So this becomes a little bit mm, more difficult as far as the main player goes. But this is why you have a story mode, and we can select and insert. <coughs> um, what can we insert? Uh, is it, well, okay, hold on. That, that, insert. Huh. I'm not seeing it down here okay let's cheat a bit then we'll take that and delete it 
Okay, so this is why we have a story mode, to, 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 uh, access to a story mode, because we could do the main sequence as a series of shots, as a series of animation takes. So we'd be saying, okay, when you get to here, hold. If you're doing this, hold. If you're doing this, hold, etc., etc., to allow for the introduction of different takes within to the, into the stream. So as I add this totally different, uh, well, Trooper 1 is actually the take that we're using. If I, no, is it? No. Okay. So if I add that to the take, you can see how it, the story mode overrides whatever information is being contained within this, within the stream. So if I want to change this out to something a little bit different, let's say um, uh, zombie moves, attack one, throw that down there. You know, automatically snaps to a zero point. Totally different set of anima animation. So as long as we have the sequences in place, we can uh, align those in our story mode here. So our entire sequence, pl sequence as to 2,000 frames within within our graph down here. Like we can go ahead a as an example in or and uh, insert current take into our timeline here, and then we can retime easily the uh, take itself within the flow. So. By the same token, we can add different ta uh, different takes, actions, having the character act, and, and as we would edit the video, a, a video file, we edit the animations in the same manner until, of course, we have 2,000 frames worth of action based on a series of takes that might be involved in achieving the final result. Blah, 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 etc., etc. So this is what we get as far as the main character being introduced uh, verbatim, verbos, as to how we um, ripped it from uh, the sequence uh, demo. And uh, we're going to take this a, a little bit further. And we're going to say, okay, well, let's add Trooper 1. Uh, the same process would occur as far, far as bringing this data information into Unreal 4, making everything line up based on the, uh, the performance. So, in theory, we would actually build the environment around the action instead of making, uh, making the characters conform to the environment that they're in. So we hit play. Oops. Hit play. I think, uh, I think we got, Houston, we got a problem here. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and sort of back step a bit. And we'll do a new and don't save. And we'll go ahead and quickly jump back into where we were by bringing in the main open all takes. And we hit the play button. And we should be back to normal square one again. We select two for one. We bring two for one in. All takes uh, two per four. Okay, I forgot that maybe we were overriding the current. Yeah, okay, there we go. So now we have a recognizable uh, sequence that is occurring here that you've seen in the exam uh, you know, over and over again in the same example. And okay, we can go ahead and change the timing on this and what have you. And the character's doing some other dance that is not relative to to the character already in play here. So we we'll probably have to go to another character sequence here. We're going to go uh, select that. Let's go two for one. Select the animation data that's been applied to this relative to world origin zero zero. So if we see this behavior acting out as scripted. Our other character comes in and starts behaving in, in an unruly manner, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we just keep going. Here's here's number three, two for two. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll try to avoid having to play back until we can see the character actually move in. And to finish it all off, and this now that is turning into a rather long, ty longish type of uh, video here, we'll bring in Trooper 3, or the, the final Trooper, so that gives us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 characters in the same scene, but in reality, the, uh, the actual acting and the animation is based on the interaction between two pe pe two people. So we can keep going and adding. We can make, create, uh, you know, a scene with uh, 10 characters in it, 100 characters, and they're all into this dust up. Uh, more or less, the, the Burly Brawl in uh, Matrix, this is more or less how it's done. It's just recycling the same animation and then uh, combining that with the repositioning the characters into into two different orientation as to relative as to the main character actor. So we go ahead and hit play. Boom. And uh, we'll let it run through. And of course, once we're done with this, we'll call this uh, we'll call this uh, this party uh, over. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, there we go. And that brings in our uh, 
another attempt here pick up the knife and do a little stab stab okay to note at this point since since it is allowed by the terms and conditions of, based on uh, uh, the Unreal 4 engine licensing I am perfectly within my rights to take this little clip here right here and use this in Urban Terror Resurgence as yet another takedown and even this as a possible takedown and since I have story mode it's easy to edit it down of course for t proper timing what have you and lucky us all our relative root nodes are all all referenced off of zero 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 origin so all we have to worry about is where the current location local uh, location of the character is, is in within 3d space and adjust for that here's the last guy coming in boom 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 so here we get the another another thing that we can kind of rip off is that <laughs> the finalization of a knife attack you know uh, we uh, uh, if you're not familiar with Unreal 4 uh, melee fights with knives is is one of the more let's say interesting aspect of a competitive scene where they determine sides and, and maps and what have you it usually consists of some kind of knife fight to begin with so <laughs> I think that would be a rather interesting way to finish things off so, uh, anyways, uh, as hopefully as useful information, uh, this is would be as a process. This would be my pro, a, an exam, an examination as to this, the, the craziness that goes inside my head when I'm looking at make creating the necessary animations for whatever project that I'm happen to working on, and the flexibility of a power tool called Motion Builder as to the flexibility of moving stuff around without having to resort to whatever quick fix that might be available to. Uh, to the uh, average person as uh, as a band-aid fake make it work kind of feature and contained within Unreal 4 so um, I think I'll call this one done um, you know uh, if you like this kind of stuff give me a thumbs up I might do a little bit more on uh, on animation processing processing data how 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 uh, how to create a, a, a flexible flexible and usable animation pipeline between external applications in this case motion builder and unreal 4 and until that time um uh, at least i hope but i at least <laughs> managed to entertain you in some form or manner <laughs>